Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Anne Speaks end of year uh, webinar this morning, um, entitled Biochar and Broadacre Agriculture. Um, Biofertilizers, uh, precision, precision ag agronomics, and nutrient dense food. Um, we have three excellent speakers uh, this morning, which is Ewan Beaumont, who's the Director of Farmers, Energy Farmers Australia. Melissa Rebick, who's the Director of Climate Agricultural Support, and Stuart Larson, who is the uh, Executive Chairman of Soft Agriculture and Mara Seeds. And uh, yeah, they're all effectively um, farmers or, or ex-farmers. So um, uh, welcome. It should be a really interesting webinar. This will run for an hour and a half, and each presenter will uh, present for 20 minutes. We also have a couple of special guests, um, foundational members, uh, Craig Bagnell at Cedar Group and uh, Professor Stephen Joseph. Uh, from uh, He's a visiting professor from five universities and uh, they're gonna um, uh, just explore um, uh, some um, figures and data on the agronomics, the economic value um, and application rates of biochar. And um, for the audience out there, um, if you uh, would like to, um, oh, and at the end of that, we'll have a 20 minute Q&A discussion. Um, so if you're in the audience and you would like to ask a question, please uh, type that as you think of it into the Q&A panel. Um, and uh, uh, we'll come to you at the end. And so therefore just introducing uh, Sam Sagami, our general manager. Um, Sam will be moderating the questions. So please say hello, Sam, this morning. Good morning, if everyone. Hello. <laughs> and, um, and then um, if you're a panelist and you want to ask a question, you can type, uh, type that in the chat room. You can also make comments and have a discussion within the chat room, or if you've got anything interesting to share, yeah, please put it up in the in the chat room and uh, yeah, we, we can have an offline discussion as well. So um, that's pretty much it. And I'm going to hand over now um, to the, I'm going to uh, stop my share and hand over to our first presenter, which is uh, Ewan Beaumont. Um, and uh, Ewan is uh, uh, the co-founder of Energy Farmers Australia. Um, the core of any Energy Farmers Australia business is working with farmers to unlock their potential to develop bioenergy and waste to energy uh, projects through existing and emerging technologies. And they partner with stakeholders to design and develop projects that uses waste to meet on-site power requirements. Uh, Ewan has over 20 years experience in agriculture. Ewan leases his farm to local farmers at, from Mullawa in WA and takes a keen interest in the Western Australian agriculture industry. Always passionate about the land and environment, Ewan believes that integrating biochar and bioenergy into the Australian food production systems will lead to more sustainable uh, communities. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Ewan. Thanks, Don, and thanks for that great intro. I haven't heard that one. Uh, I think I wrote it, but um, haven't heard it for a while. Look, I'll get straight into my presentation. Uh, so I'll share my screen. You guys can see that? We can. Uh, just put it on the slideshow. So um, this morning, I'm really just going to have a very high level look at the opportunity to integrate biochar into the West Australian broad acre farming system. Um, bit of background, Energy Farmers formed in 2010 with my business partner, Tom Bogan. Uh, Tom's an engineer and I, like Don mentioned, I've, I've come from an agriculture background. We've been developing pyrolysis technology on, uh, during the journey and we scored our first commercial project last year and we're developing an end-to-end -end waste management solution for a really problematic waste, waste stream. Uh, the picture below is um, the first stage constructed and commissioned. So we're about to kick off the second stage of that, which is really exciting. 
Um, the WA Wheat Belt pretty much runs, I'm based here in Geraldton. Uh, the farm where I grew up is just east of Geraldton, about 100 k's inland. And the Wheat Belt runs from just north of Geraldton, right through, down through here uh, to Esperance and, and uh, east of Esperance. The closer you are to that line, the more marginal the, the rainfall. Back when I was farming 20 years ago, we were, you know, it was classified as a 350 mil rainfall zone. That's now shifted to being more 200, 250. Uh, although this year we've had a really good start and a lot of the farmers in the region of, or across the state have had their annual rainfall already and we're only into June. So it'll be interesting to see how the, the rest of the year pans out. Uh, the uh, the down through this area, if you can see my mouse uh, around through here, a lot more timber. I'm not really focusing on the timber today, <clears throat> uh, but more fo focusing on cropping. Through this area down here, there's a, a lot more livestock, so cattle and sheep. Um, there used to be a lot of sheep right across the state. But 20 years ago, when the uh, wool market crashed, a lot of farmers got out of sheep and didn't really get back into them. And, you know, even on my property, most of the fences have come out and they're just big open paddocks uh, set up for year in, year out cropping. So that's a bit of an intro to the wheat belt. Uh, it's separated into four port zones. You've got Geraldton, Quinana, Albany and Esperance. There's about 4,700 farms or farmers in the state, and the average farm size is about 4,500 hectares. Although I know many farmers that are cropping 10 to 15,000 hectares every year. So, and there's been a lot of corporates have moved in in the last five or six years, and and buy, you know and cropping over their portfolio, you know, over 100,000 hectares. Uh, last year we delivered 15 million tonnes of grain. Uh, which is predominantly made up of wheat, lupins and canola with some barley and oats and uh, field peas. And that contributed $4 billion to the state uh, annually. So big paddocks, big machinery, very high input, chemicals, fertilisers, fuels, and inputs such as fertiliser and fuel are largely fossil-based. Crop input costs vary on location. The closer you are to the, the lower rainfall areas, the cheaper it is to put in a crop, but you're looking at $250 to, to $600 a hectare, probably more in some of the very high rainfall zones. And yields range from about one to, to five tonne per hectare. Uh, the, the, in my area, which is marginal, a, a one tonne crop is a break even point. So, and I think in Mullawar, the long-term average is about two tonne over about a 10 year period, two tonne per hectare. Interesting fact, um, back in the late 40s after the war, 50s and 60s, 90% of the WA wheat belt was cleared for agriculture purposes. And I remember my dad telling me there used to be a catch craze of a million acres a year. And over a 20 year period, you know, they pretty much cleared 20 million hectares. So you can, yeah, the, the, the landscape is denuded of trees. Now, because we're in such a high impact, uh, high input uh, uh, farming system, we uh, and using lots of chemicals, um, chemical resistance has become a, a major issue for farmers. And there's a few different ways of control or ways of controlling this um, or minimise the impact of chemical resistance. And one of them is to lay you know, the header row. Uh, well, into rows, so that the, the crop residue into rows, and then so that's that harvest, and then coming back in March or April, and then when it's cooler, and then burning those residues at night uh, uh, to, to kill the weed seeds, basically, but obviously creates greenhouse gas emissions and leaves soil prone to erosion if the, if the fire gets away, and wastes a valuable biomass resource, in our opinion, and it's really you know, that was the catalyst for me wanting to get involved because in bioenergy, because I thought, saw an opportunity to be able to capture this, extract the energy and, and produce um, beneficial byproducts. This is another method of weed control. Uh, 
these are called uh, chaff carts. And basically you have an elevator off the back of the harvester, goes into a cart. When it's full or at the end of each end of the paddock, they, they dump it out and come back in March and burn it. And more recently, they're developing these bolt-on systems. They're called weed destructors. And basically they pulverize the weed as it's coming out, uh, going over the sieves. And uh, then they spread it out on the ground. Uh, fairly expensive option, but I think they're, they're gaining a bit of momentum in, in terms of it as a management tool. So um, we've got plenty of biomass, so there's opportunities to collect this. And this is actually on, on my property out at Mullawar. Uh, Tom and I, a few years ago, we, we were doing some research. So we bailed up some straw just to see what, over a couple of years, just to see um, how, how, how much material we were getting per, per uh, tonne of grain. And so, and we did this with a conventional baler. So it's certainly feasible. Uh, there's another system called the, well, this is called the Glenbar Harvest Direct, but I'm sure there's more like this out there where they basically capture the resource that's coming off the back of the header straight into a baler. Uh, there may be some pushback from farmers for this type of system. I, I think it's the best type because you're actually getting very clean feedstock. It's not touching the ground, whereas a conventional baler, you, the, the materials first on the uh, on the ground first. So a uh, bit of a pushback from farmers because they don't want to be towing around a baler um, because it's going to increase the, the cost of harvest and also the timeliness of harvest. Um, but you know, we have a bit of an idea of a way around that. Uh, the industry estimate is about $60 to $80 a tonne for baled straw, and this is made up of nutrient removal, because when you remove straw, you're removing nutrients in, in potash in particular, or potassium, and also the cost of baling. That, that number there really doesn't um, represent any, any uh, profit for the farmer. The Australian Renewable Energy Mapping Index or indicator in estimates is about 200 million, the 2 million tonnes available uh, statewide. Uh, we actually think there's a fair bit more than that. There's Tom, we, we've been, we were out weighing bales and we estimate we could sustainably harvest about a tonne of biomass, you know, pretty much across the state, except in areas where there is, um, you know, you're only getting one tonne to, to 1.5 yields, anything greater than that, you can pull off more than, more than that. So it just gives you an indication of the scale. So um, just some really rough numbers. Uh, you know, if we're targeting 8 million hectares of cropping land, we at 15% could produce 240,000 tonne of biochar and at 50, 50 kilo a hectare, that, that we could spread that over nearly 5 million hectares. Um, and the CO2 estimate based on 65% carbon and a stable carbon of 70%, you know, there's 400 odd thousand um, CO2 equivalents. Uh, I think these 65 and 70 is quite, um, uh, I think we've been cautious there. Uh, so that just gives you an opportunity of the scale potential. The other, um, the other opportunity I think is tree crops, especially in a drying climate. The one most talked about is the Mallee. Uh, a Remi estimate there's about 100,000 tonnes in the ground. And obviously you've got biomass for energy production uh, plus eucalyptus oil. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of other species that we've played around with. Uh, old man saltbush can be planted on saline land. Um, there's a 1 million hectares severely affected in WA, costing the state about half a billion dollars a year. And there's also a, a, some uh, acacia species, which are very hardy in a drying climate. And um, both those species have the ability to coppice. Uh, the pushback from farmers, and I hear it a lot from, especially some of the younger farmers, <clears throat> excuse me, is that when you're planting tree crops, uh, you're not only taking productive uh, land out of the system, you're also reducing yield of nearby crops. So, in a, especially in a dry year, these areas in between the rows, uh, the trees compete for nutrients and moisture. And, uh, and also, 
this soil in between the, the rows might be a three ton, two to three ton potential. And at the moment, you know, trees are, you know, they're, they're basically worth nothing. So especially the younger farmers, they're, they're, they're not that keen to plant, to, to plant trees. But, you know, in a drying climate, I think uh, perennial tree crops have a real opportunity in the wheat belt. And, you know, let's face it, 20 million hectares destroyed over, over a 20 year period, we, we probably need to plant a few more back. So annual biochar protection, uh, production potential at oil mallee, again, very rough numbers, but if we were targeting 5%, 15 million hectares, 375,000 tonnes of biochar uh, and over 600,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalents. Again, it just gives you an indication of the scale. And, and these numbers really aren't, um, I haven't taken into account any transport and harvesting costs. Yeah. So environmental costs are through an LCA. So there's, we've been trialling biochar in horticulture and broad scale. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some other trials that we, we, we know of. Uh, I've, I've, I have reached out to a few grower groups who have used biochar, but I haven't, haven't had anything back. So uh, GRDC were looking at biochar back in 2009. Um, they had a three year research project looking at microbial processes and pesticide breakdown. Um, I won't go too much into the detail here, but they found that uh, 10 high rates of biochar suppress, suppress zimazine breakdown and reduce leaching in the soil water, and that biochar at 25 tonne decreased nitrate, nitrate and ammonia leaching, but also decreased yield. However, they pointed out that the results were non-conclusive and different biochar types and soils may produce varying effects. And the, the, the real reason I put this slide here is because I've been to a few DRDC grower meetings in the region and and when you talk about, when you mention biochar, you can see their eyes glaze over and, and I actually had the comment on not another biochar trial. And I think though, you know, in the early days, they, they, they threw a fair bit of money at it and they were actually, you know, they were burnt from, from and then found no real uh, positive benefits of biochar, especially at those kind of rates. And I think a more, and I think Craig's going to talk about it later, but you know, a more targeted response, and I'm going to mention it as well, is, is what's needed. And this is what um, mo uh, many of you might know Paul Blackwell. Uh, he lives here in Durham. I, I kept up with him quite a bit. He uh, and the Minginu Irwin group, which is, which is quite a progressive group uh, just south of here, they trialled biochar back in 2011 uh, using... they use two different types of biochar at two different rates with, DA, at, with varying rates of DAP fertiliser. Uh, they found that high rate of poultry litter biochar improved yield at all levels. And that's that line there. Uh, sorry, this line here. That's the poultry litter biochar. Uh, and they've also found that wheat chaff or wheat straw biochar benefit the yield at low P levels. And that's that line there, with, compared to the control of DAP. Five minutes remaining, Craig. Uh, oh, sorry, Ewan. Sorry? Uh, you've just got five minutes remaining. Yeah, cool. Um, we based a lot of our research on the SAMFA trials, which found that banning low rates of biochar can improve fertiliser efficiency, reduce input costs and improve profitability. And the 35 kilo was the best rate. So based on that, back in 2015, we mixed biochar with fertiliser, with farmer standard treatment fertiliser. This is the uh, farmer standard treatment. That's what he uses year in, year out. We mixed it with, we reduced the rate of that treatment plus 35 kilo of biochar. And we actually got a, a yield uh, response. Um, this is 110 kilo of agrass plus 100 kilo of wheat straw biochar, and we got yield responses there as well. It wasn't that significant in the as a, as trials go, but the yield the when you calculated the the gross margin, the 50 percent plus 35 kilo of poultry litter biochar actually performed the best, except the control. The control had no fertilizer, so that year you could put a crop in. Um, without fertiliser. However, uh, it was a very 
very dry year. We only averaged about 1.5. 2016, we were due to uh, put the same treatments over the same plots. We wanted to see what the year, what, what we'd get over consecutive years. Um, and we, very high rainfall year, but the, the day before we were allowed, about to lay the trials down, um, farmer calls me, sorry, deep rip has gone into the paddock, you lost your markings. So we had to start again, which is disappointing. Because of the higher rainfall, the fertiliser outperformed each of the other biochar treatments. However, back to the economic analysis, and these are just our rough numbers, yeah? They've not been verified, independently verified. Obviously, control again performed well. The pharma treatment performed very well as well economically, but the 50% pharma treatment performed just as well. And I was having this discussion with Craig by email last night. Is there an could, or could there be an incentive here for farmers to use less fertiliser, which would make the economic model stack up much more? Uh, we're also playing around with the liquid fertiliser. It looks pretty significant here, the yield difference. It's about 70 kilo, but this is a farmer standard treatment. Uh, at 50 litres a hectare, we've enhanced it with biochar and used it at the same rate, got a slight increase, and then a 70 kilo a hectare increase here when we reduce the rate to 35. This is exciting. We, we're looking into this a little bit more. Uh, just to close, the future for broad scale agriculture and the potential to integrate biochar, I think is, ex is exciting or interesting. That, um, however, rainfall's declining. Integrating biochar in a farming system will be complex. Carbon and economy is here, so Puro Earth and, and recognised ERF methods will help with that integration. Energy will be critical, especially if we move to batteries and biofuels, so there'll be opportunities there. Um, I think we need to assess local resources at a, at a, a farm, uh, farmer group level, and then we need to engage in long-term targeted trials similar to what Sanford did. Uh, I think that just about wraps me up. So happy to take some questions later or, yeah, if we have time. So I'm just going to stop sharing now. Thank you, Ewan. Um, very, very informative uh, presentation. And uh, if you've got questions for Ewan, please type them in the Q&A if you're out in the audience. And if you're a panellist, type the questions in the chat room and Sam will come to you later. Uh, so we'll move straight on to the next uh, presenter. And Melissa, if you want to now share, turn on your video and share your screen. And uh, Melissa Rebic, uh, is, um, uh, she is a director and farm manager and has directed her company, Climate and Agricultural Support Propriety Limited, con to conduct over 12 projects supporting local and national farm managers. Uh, to improve productivity and profitability in the face of climate change. Some of these projects include biochar and fertiliser, soil health projects and fact sheets related to soil carbon sequestration, biochar feed supplement, soil and pasture health case studies. Melissa runs a beef herd in, on Hindmarsh Island, contending firsthand with drought, drought, river health issues and climate change. Melissa sits on a number of boards and groups to sustainable, uh, to support sustainable agricultural and land and water management uh, and climate change mitigation. The expertise, um, yes. Yeah, so um, Melissa is also a, um, a member of the ANSPIG uh, executive board. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand over to you, Melissa, to share and yeah, enjoy. Thank you, Don. And good morning, everyone, and thanks for having me um, and speak. Um, so yes, uh, I thought that was an excellent presentation of Ewan's and um, I'm going to show you some other results of um, benefits of biochar and agriculture. And um, I just want to say, you know, I've been working as a, a farmer, but as a researcher slash extension person for um, nearly 30 years, getting a bit old, but this is the most exciting work I've done I think I think biochar has a huge ability to transform agriculture but as as we say mitigate and adapt to climate change which um, excites me um, and I know most of you probably already on board know what biochar is but I just wanted to talk about the the process in which biochar is made 
in the absence of oxygen, um, cold pyrolysis is important and it's what differs it from um, normal charcoal. And there's often those questions that I get when we go out and see farmers. And I think it's that pyrolysis process that's really important because it activates the biochar. And it means that it's positively charged with anions and cations. And when that's put in the soil, it will um, attract minerals and nutrients to it. And it's like putting a battery uh, in the minerals and nutrients and making them much more available to plants or animals if animals are consuming it. And it's that that is um, one of the most important processes of biochar, but also the fact that it is porous and it can, uh, because it's porous, it has a higher surface area and more areas where this exchange process can occur. And also um, because it is porous, it can absorb moisture. And when in the soil, provide a, a house and a microbial bridge for minerals and nutrients and, and, and microbes to survive within the soil and, uh, and increase. Um, so biochar can be produced from any carbon-based feedstock, including biomass from farms and food waste. And as Ewan has just shown, making it from wheat straw, um, and it's estimated that there's 50 to 100 million metric tonnes per year of biomass residues that go into landfill or a burn, which could be able to be uh, made into biochar. And that's why Ansbig's excited because, you know, we've estimated that there's 7.5 to $15 billion um, worth of biochar, uh, worth of waste that can be turned into biochar. So it's a, it's a huge potential for um, for growth in Australia. Um, biochar provides a range of valuable carbon-based products and services with multiple environmental, agricultural, economic and social co-benefits. So some of the work that I've done um, has looked at improving cross crop yields, um, we've improved animal production, we've improved feed conversion, we've improved milk yield um, and just, just moving and um, we need to do more in the space of greenhouse gases and I think that that's an emerging or has emerged the ability to do that. And there's, that's a, there's a real trade on um, you know, biochar and its ability to um, be used as a, as a carbon drawdown technology. Um, it can be used in circular economy systems and um, you know, it's, it's waste of energy. So just quickly touching on some of the work that was done by one of the researchers with ANSBIG, um, showing the different uses of biochar um, and um, animal feed is one of the top ones, but crop yield effect, um, but also reducing um, synthetic chemical fertilizers and soil rehabilitation um, and increasing soil carbon. So those top ones, I've all I've done lots of research in those that space and give you a bit more detail shortly. Um, but there's a net use of benefit as well from anywhere from $100 per tonne of biochar up to $20,000 per tonne of biochar in potatoes. And so these, this is um, the white paper that's uh, on the ANSBIG website that you can have a look at and look at the different um, case studies. Um, and I've recently completed one in dairy and uh, per tonne of biochar, we've got a minimum of uh, $2,000 per tonne of biochar used. Um, Doug Powell did some work in Western Australia, if there's any of you there, and he showed that when he put biochar in avocados, he got in the first year, um, compared to the control, uh, there was an increase, a fourfold increase in the yield of avocados, but also the size of avocados. Um, in potatoes, they found that there's not only bigger potatoes, but also uh, increased yield and their net user benefit per tonne of biochar in a potato trial in Ballarat was $53,400 per tonne of biochar. Um, there's been biochar used in beef feedlots and um, this one shows the average daily gain was um, better when there was 1% uh, biochar incorporated within the feed in the feedlots. Um, and the theories behind that are better feed conversion it has a redox active process in the rumen and basically means that the minerals and nutrients within the uh, feed are more absorbed and uh, they're just getting better growth because their, uh, their rumen is able to utilise those nutrients and minerals. 
but not only that, biochar will absorb toxins and in beef feedlots and sheep feedlots, often the, the protein content is, is very high and bordering on too high, which can create toxic, toxicity in animals. And so it absorbs that those toxins and mitigates that as an issue. So I completed a biochar dairy trial where we had um, less than 150 grams of biochar per head per day for a year. And we used Mara Seeds biochar, which Stuart Larson's coming on to talk about. It's a fabulous product. It's uh, made out of eucalyptus and sorghum. And uh, we fed it 150 grams per head per day for a year. Um, really easy to do because we could mix it straight into the mix in, in the, um, at the dairy. And we got 1.4 litres per head per day increase in milk yield. Um, some of our studies suggest that perhaps not all of that yield was related to the biochar. Um, it's, it's uncertain because it's, we didn't have a control. But when we compare that to um, 2016 and 17, certainly the yields were 1.4 litres per head per day more. And the farmer reported an increase in income of $30,000 at minimum. And um, he also talked about that there was um, a much better feed conversion. So he fed uh, one big round bale, two big round bales, sorry, less per week to these animals, which also resulted in um, an additional $12,000 um, less fodder that was needed to be fed. And again, it really um, shows that you're getting much better feed conversion by feeding biochar. And I think in this particular dairy as well, um, that Barry Clark is a very high chemical user and he will uh, re-establish his pastures every two to three years. So he's putting Roundup on and re pastures and re-putting on nitrogen fertilizers. And so it's a, really um, pushing the system. And I think that uh, biochar in his system really helped. And just to show you the, um, we had a much bigger difference in the two-year-old animals compared to some of the more mature animals. So um, if you look here at this slide, um, it's the, the blue line here shows you the milk yield back in 2000, uh, June 2017, where there was only about 14.5 litres per head per day. And then we look back up here to September 19, um, biochar was fed during the year of 2019. Um, we're up to around 20.5 litres per head per day. So um, a big difference um, and uh, much bigger growth in the younger animals. And we think that, that it has a, a, um, an improvement process on the rumen function in younger animals as that rumen is developing. So um, just wanted to show that, you know, even if we had an increase of $30,000, that's a net user benefit of $2,222. Um, but we're not even considering what happens to that biochar when it hits the soil. So there's another component of this research where um, I went out and did some pre-soil testing and then a year later went back and um, tested the soil again. Um, the farmers, especially in the Fleury, have a high prevalence population of dung beetles. So I'm just going to talk about that part now. Um, I'm going to get back to just to summarise before we go on to that. Um, we found improved feed conversion, increased milk yields and solids, and a substantial increase in profits. Um, there's a whole lot of other benefits of, of feeding um, biochar animals. Um, so in the soil, we found um, benefits as well. So after nine months, we went back and we found anecdotal evidence, if you like, for increased carbon, uh, increased uh, soil health, um, increased minerals in the soil, uh, increased minerals in the pasture and um, uh, increased fungi in the soil. Um, because what happens is that that biochar is not absorbed in the rumen. There's only a percent, there's a very small percent that's absorbed. And then it remains in the rumen, in, it remains in the dung. The dung was tested by Professor Stephen Joseph, that's who's coming on shortly. We found that dung is much more bioactive and then that dung is then buried by dung beetles. So we've got this animal improvement, but then we've also got this uh, flow on effect of the soil health improvement. And the Flurio beef group and um, Flurio in itself are um, spreading and releasing the spring active beetles. There's um, also winter and summer beetles. So they play a very important role. 
So with this anecdotal evidence, I thought better go out and do this in a proper replicated trial. So we set up some uh, split plot block design and we put biochar in dung, biochar under dung, no biochar and had um, uh, um, no dung as well. So we looked at the differences of that and I've just hold off the press, got the results for, for those as well. So I'm gonna just share some of those quickly with you. Um, but before I do, 50 cows do one tonne of dung a day. 250 cows do five tonnes of dung a day and in a year, 1,825 tonnes of dung. So over 200 hectares, which is what this property was, that's a spread rate of 9.1 tonnes per hectare of activated manure. Who spreads fertiliser at that rate? We just had you and on. Farmers would be spreading in cereal areas probably no more than 100, 150 kilograms per hectare of, of nitrate-based uh, fertilisers. Here we are in, in, in livestock systems, we're getting a spread rate of 9.1 tonnes per hectare. Now this is in a dairy, much, much different in other properties. Stuart's coming on, he's got 10,000 hectares. So certainly wouldn't get that spread rate, but in dairies, really great opportunity to improve your soil health. So let's have a look at what happens. So when we've got um, biochar um, at 200 kilograms in the dung, uh, we had much greater biomass than um, the nothing plots where there was no dung at all um, or where we just had the control. So we had, um, you know, so we had three different measurements and um, certainly um, in the October springtime, um, there was greater biomass compared to um, the dung only, and that is statistical difference. And we also got, um, when we're comparing to the nothing plots, uh, much greater biomass when we've got 100 um, kilos under the dung or 200 kilos um, under the dung. The reason why we put it in the dung is trying to replicate what happens when the dung goes through a cow. Um, but um, it's probably not the same process because there's, a, there's something that happens that biochar when it passes through the rumen as well. Uh, we also found um, increasing mycorrhizae fungi. And to me, this is really exciting. That was a statistical difference as well. When we had 200 kilograms um, in the dung and also even 200 kilos under the dung because uh, fungi and bacteria balances out within our soils and when there's chemicals applied, we have really huge uh, growth in the bacteria and not enough fungi. And it just um, kind of stops the fungi from being able to uh, proliferate the soils. And fungi are really important because they attach onto roots and root systems and they can furrow, the, it's like an extended root system, there's small thin hairs down into the soil up to two, three, four meters and find nutrients and minerals that wouldn't normally be found. And that is a really important thing to kind of conceptualize, especially in cropping systems, um, how important these fungi are. And so where we found, we found much more fungi when we had um, biochar in the dung buried by dung beetles. So this is a picture of some fungi. You can see there's little root hairs here. And um, we find that biochar, I actually feed biochar to my cattle and um, everywhere there's manure and dung beetles have buried that manure, I find all sorts of fungi coming up, toadstools, mushrooms, that sort of thing. Really good indicator you've got good mycorrhizae fungi. But you can see here the little soil globules that are all, how sticky it is. And that's what the fungi do as well. So they pull soils together and they make them work as a functioning ecosystem. And we know that the top 10 centimetres of soil sustains most life on earth. And we've really mucked with the, micro, um, the microbes within the soil. And biochar plays such an important role to help rebuild that. And I've mentioned some of the reasons why. Um, okay, so um, we looked minutes at- minutes left, Melissa. Okay, I'll just skip through a couple of these. This is probably the, the clincher that I really wanted to show you is that um, with that biochar in the dung is that um, we found if we look here with the biochar, um, I've got top, but it's actually in the dung. Um, we found a difference in organic carbon. So we were comparing it to the control. We got 
about 2.8% carbon. And if we look at the um, biochar on top of the dung, we got about 3.2. If you look at the biochar under the dung, we got 3.5% carbon. So if you look at 2.8 to 3.5, big difference. Um, I actually then uh, translated that into, because we did um, into um, what tons per hectare that meant, because we took bulk densities and pretty much found a difference of around four tons per hectare of carbon in nine months comparing it to the control. So um, four tonnes per hectare of carbon is um, pretty much game changing in my, in my book um, in, in, in nine months. What does that mean in terms of payback from the emission reduction fund? So um, one tonne per hectare of carbon sequestered per year, you've got to times that by 3.67 to get your carbon dioxide equivalents. And at the moment, the Australian carbon credit unit is worth $16.50 per tonne. So one tonne per hectare, you, you get a payback of $60.55 per hectare through the Emission Reduction Fund. At four tonnes per hectare, you get a payback of $242.22 per, um, so per hectare. So um, when people say, look, it's just not worth signing up to the Emission Reduction Fund, well, if biochar can do that to your soil by putting on 200 kilos and you get back four tonnes, um, I think that it's a, it's a game changer there as well. pH was um, better as well. Um, so look, just to summarise, biochar, feeding biochar to an animal in the presence of dung beetles improves production profitability, builds soil carbon health pH and cation exchange capacity, increases soil moisture holding capacity and reduces runoff increases soil carbon because it is 90% carbon, it adapts to and mitigates climate change, but also we're reducing that um, it, it, methane fermentation that needs to be better measured um, by burying the dung as well. We haven't got the um, methane escaping and nitrous oxides from the manure as well. Um, adding biochar to the soil will do all of the above, reduce also dependence on synthetic fertilisers. Dung trials in that I will um, at 100 and 200 kilos per hectare, re reiterating what Ewan showed. Um, it ameliorates soil toxins, increases soil pH. It can be an alternative to lime and gypsum as well because it changes your pH, increases your soil water holding capacity. And there's papers to show that for every 1% you increase your water holding your carbon, you increase your water holding capacity by 10 tonnes per hectare. Um, and that you can improve your agricultural production for every 1% you increase your soil carbon, you can increase your production by 10 to 30%. Um, so look, I've summarized some of those benefits. I just quickly wanted to touch on the carbon drawdown. Um, so I know Craig and there's a, a presentation on ANSBIG's website about carbon drawdown. Um, biochar, there's a real emerging opportunity being recognized how it is a part of um, agricultural's contribution towards net zero because every ton of carbon you create and you put that back in the soil again is not just through the ERF recognised on the international carbon market as a carbon drawdown opportunity. Um, so biochar is being recognised as a drawdown methodology because it's 90% carbon. Each ton we put back into the earth is, is carbon drawdown. And there's some real changes to um, you know, landscapes and things that we can achieve by, by making biochar and, and by producing feedstocks as, as Ewan showed in, in some of those opportunities. So um, one minute last, left, yeah, last bit is so, uh, you know, a colleague of mine produced this, which talks about the different carbon sink options. And often we think about wind and solar and alternative energy production, but where biochar comes in is it's a sink. It's the only way that you can actually take, or one of the ways that you can take carbon back out of the atmosphere and put it back into the soil. We're doing that by making biochar, but we're also doing that by putting biochar in the soil and, and um, increasing the soil's ability to sequester carbon. Um, that's it from me. Thank you. So I will... Um, hand that back over to Don, so I'll stop sharing and um, I'll happy to answer questions in the Q&A. 
Thanks very much, Melissa. Um, very informative as, as usual. And you can check out um, Melissa's website, uh, Climate, Agriculture, Climate and Agricultural Support. Uh, she's got a lot of uh, resources up on, uh, up on her website there. And uh, also I would like to highlight that um, uh, ANSBIG also has a number of uh, resources on our resources page, which is here. And um, particular, particularly uh, have a look at the um, users report uh, that we did. You can, it's a free download there. Um, and that was led by um, Professor Stephen Joseph, who's coming up um, shortly. Um, so that's a really good um, uh, report on the value of biochar and wood vinegar. So thank you, Melissa. Um, we will uh, look forward to seeing you at the uh, conference, our conference in Perth, with a bit of luck um, and no COVID. Also, I just wanted to highlight too, and I'll put it in the chat room, that uh, the development of a new bi uh, biochar methodology is now underway. So uh, that's by Vera, a very well-known um, uh, carbon standard in the US. Um, they're now developing a methodology for biochar and uh, so the beauty of the voluntary carbon markets is that there's no actual um, international uh, borders or boundaries. So um, any any uh, user in the in the world can register under the uh, voluntary carbon markets. So um, uh, I will now uh, hand over to uh, Stuart Larson. Um, and uh, Stuart, if you want to have a, a go at sharing your screen while I'm introducing you, and uh, if you get stuck, we'll, we'll revert back to plan B. Um, but Stuart Larson is the Managing Director of uh, Mara Seeds and Soft Agriculture. Um, he founded that in, or in 1967. Um, that was a fantastic year. Um, Stuart, I can attest to that because um, that was the year I was born. And uh, it was in the mid 1990s um, that the management team at Mara Seeds identified the diminishing returns on artificial fertiliser and chemical uh, systems and increased costs, both financially and health related. In 1996, management, management changed its approach to organic farming and since then has built and developed organic products for domestic and export markets with the view of promoting the Australian organic industry. Through his innovation and forward uh, thinking approach to farming, in 2012, Stuart decided to evolve the Mara Seeds brand to reflect his vision of carbon smart farming. Soft agriculture, which is short for sustainable organic farming techniques was established and using a unique blend of biochar, developed a range of organic fertilizers, livestock feeds, and additives that support high yield productivity gains while offering the best possible health benefits for plants and livestock. So over to you, Stuart. That's good. Can you see the screen all right? Not, not yet. Oh. So, Sam, do you want to just yeah. run Stuart through I that? Can, again? I can see it here. I can see it here, but um, so, I can't get it through. Yeah, Stuart, so if you just click the uh, share screen button. It's not coming up. Um, At the bottom of the screen, uh, Stuart, just hover over the bottom of the screen and it'll say share screen. Just not seeing that. Okay. okay. Well, we'll revert back to Plan B. Um, yep. Sam, do you want to um, bring up Stuart's? Uh, Absolutely. Stuart slides at your end. Um, don't worry, Stuart. I I couldn't do it either the first time. Stuart, can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, I can see I can see my presentation, but I can't get into the shared screen down the bottom for some reason. That's it. So Sam's now going to run through it for you. So you just tell her when to click through the sides, and she'll do it, Stuart. Got it. So can you see it there now, Sam? 
Yeah, all good. Right, I'll talk it through and I'll just say yes when I want you to go through. Right, I just thanks for having you aboard. Um, that was a good presentation by Melissa. I think it covered a lot of the things that uh, what we're doing as a business is, um, I guess, the next level of being out there trying to produce biochar and prove things to ourselves that it's absolutely uh, uh, a great product. And there's nothing we do uh, in our business here in the farming side that doesn't use biochar, whether it be uh, livestock, uh, soils, fertilizers, which is basically composts. Uh, but these slides going through um, will show you a snapshot of trying to make biochar, you might say, a valued article. So if we go to the next one, Sam. Can you hear me, Sam? Can you see that? Yeah, is, can yeah. you see the next screen? The next. Page. Yes, you got that now, a history? Yep. That says that's our history, doesn't it? That's yes. right. Right. Um, when we started, like, I guess you might say in organic agriculture, is that fine there? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can, Stuart. Right. So, okay, yeah, Stuart, can, can I just check? Stuart, can you see the screen at your end? Yeah, I can see the screen. Yeah. Okay, great. So you can see the slide that you're on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. When we, we started uh, basically into organic agriculture, and that was uh, we'd managed to damage a lot of soils, and that was chasing what you might say the immortal dollar, and um, putting more and more product on, and in fact, uh, we nuked a lot of our soils. Uh, that was when we went into more compost-based um, uh, products, and that's after a trip to the US and looking, visiting the Amish and whatever, and trying to find out how we could do this and still maintain our soils. So we basically, in, in to, to get, um, you might say, efficiency, we were looking for things that could do that. And biochar was the next level of getting a small advantage or an advantage. And um, uh, in, in, in our slide there that you can just see our history with biochar and there was no commercial biochar available. And there was plenty of charcoal about, but not biochar. Um, we, we had a couple of uh, cracks at, at building units and things and built our own and uh, one of our biggest issues was our environmental standards and um, we didn't fall out of favour but we knew that if we continued where we were and we didn't have control over our emissions and everything else if we were doing it in a larger scale and it's a thing to bear in mind that a lot of people tell you how, how what's wrong but they'll never tell you how to fix it. Um, currently under, under development we have a plant at the moment that's not completed but uh, the first stage is certainly done and it's there to to deal with a lot of those things but also get the price of our product down uh, rather than have an expensive if you spend money on plant uh, it costs money so you've got to try and utilize that plant by using many other forms of um, uh, and that'll be evident as we go through so we go to the next one Can you see that they're now current biochar production? One moment, Stuart, sorry. Go for it. Got a current biochar production, which was basically a rotary hut, um, and that's a quenching system, uh, which produces a, a biochar, but it's not got the controls which we would um, feel that you need. And, so going on to the next slide there, it will show you what we're doing. Uh, can you see that, Sam? Yes. Righto. These are the mineral reactors we've put in. Um, they're, they're based around, um, there's two of those, and uh, the capacity in that is not up to full yet. We've, we're working on the one, uh, but it'll be somewhere around about 500 kg an hour of basically our, uh, we're using mainly wood chip as our, it's the key thing we're using, but we're using 
adding other many other things in as well. But uh, the basic uh, basic wood chip is the one that. So what that does uh, that produces the biochar. But so go to the next slide. Yep. Can you see that? Right. So what we're doing there is. Those storage tanks are there to uh, store syngas, um, and that's to replace LP gas eventually. And the uh, we're storing the CO2, uh, hydrogen, um, and some nitrogen in the long term. Now that 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 is added back into, or should I say, their value-added products. The syngas um, going on from there again now. Yes. Um, that's that's a result of what we're doing, but uh, it's probably in the wrong spot. But you know that doesn't matter. We'll talk about it. In in making biochar, we've found that quenching is not the best thing to do. Uh, so what we're attempting to do at the moment is using a uh, cool sand uh, to to dry that to to stop that product. Obviously, obviously catching on fire and whatever, once you've completed your process. And um, basically that's a granulated biochar that we're doing now. And one of the advantages in that is, and you'll see in a minute when we're talking about stock feeds and all those things, a dry process or a dry product is something that we, is the only complaint we get from about using it in, uh, biochar in most of our things is that it can be dusty. So by granulating, we can get that down and basically it flows and it's a lot easier to use. So that's been, that's been a, um, developed at the moment. So it, particularly in adding into stock feeds and stuff like that, um, it's, it's much more, um, much easier to use. So we'll go to the next one, which is the products that we do produce. Have you got that? Yep, it's on there, ready for you. Yep, products. The products for animal feeds, um, there, there's biochar and animal feeds is, is really what we call a no-brainer uh, in that you can put animals onto a full ration with, uh, with biochar in there. And we work on 2% and you don't have any acidosis or um, animal. Basically, it's, it's like an antibiotic for point. One of the major things is um, the the odour control, which you, you gather. Um, and that's a big thing. At the moment, we're doing uh, further trials in two major piggeries. They're not what I call com completely controlled, but they're giving a result. So we add the we add the biochar into the igloos or the um, basically with the straw. And that's because that particular piggery has had an issue with, with some odours. And then that basically that um, uh, that manure, when it comes out, uh, should be at least 50% less in, in odour. And it's also capturing the nitrogen, which we'll use in the, in the compost process. So that's being added in and, and tried at the moment in one piggery and another piggery we're doing the same. Um, what we call litter base. And these days, and I think it's a thing that uh, as we work, go further along, people are going to people are going to be using a lot more in the sale yards and feedlots, et cetera, et cetera. We use, uh, we use rock phosphate added into the process. Uh, it's activated uh, with the heat process or thermal, and we use no sulfuric acid to make that product available to the plant. So that's a byproduct again of, of, or a usage of making biochar, but also keeping your costs down. Syngas, as I said, there is for LP replaces LP gas and power generation. Um, drying heat, mainly for drying grains and seeds uh, and pelleted uh, or granulated fertilizers. Um, CO2 not developed fully, but that will be captured and sent into plant growth. So also silo fumigation, which uh, in an organic situation, um, that's an issue and you can use CO2 to control your insects uh, in the silos. Hydrogen is a future sale item, but it will be something that we hope to use back into the uh, running of our, of our um, forklifts, et cetera. So uh, the whole process of, of producing biochar is because basically 
historically we couldn't find it anywhere or get it anywhere and it's grown a, to a point now where we're, we're so so involved with it and it's such a great product um, I think you'll uh, by the time we get to the end of this talk you'll see the uses that we actually use it for but I always say if you don't have a market don't start so we we do uh, next slide please um, yes. um, right uh, where are we that's activated by a char in our animal health. So that's in what we call our green cow, our green chicken, green sheep, green pig. Um, there, that's just a, you might say, a uh, trademark we use in that area. And that's followed with, it's been um, following a lot of, the, I'll go to the next slide quickly. Yes. So that's on our fertilizer side. Uh, you'll see, uh, go to the next one also, because I'll run out of time here, I think. Um, yeah, okay. There, the animal food, there are trademarks. Are you on that one? Um, yes. So they're trademark products, and um, it's one of those there thing that, yeah, um, it's it's our signature. That's the best way of putting it. Next slide. There's sim simple how we market in ba in bags, um, and there there are reviewer bags that you can see the product in the bags. So next slide. Our his, first start in, in biochar to prove for ourselves and everything else was to do large trials with CKU in Rockhampton in, in the poultry industry. Uh, and I'll flick through these slides fairly quickly, but they'll show you, show you the, um, uh, that was done with including CSIRO and uh, CKU and um, a couple of, we've done a number of sheds, I think it's probably half a dozen through the industry uh, with really great results. Next slide. Yes. That shows in the egg laying trial, the sort of results we've got there. Um, it's, it's something um, that's not a, we, were, we weren't doing using litter base, but, but enhancing the manures greatly at that stage. Next one, that's the, so the bird weight in those sheds, we were getting a 4.9% increase in bird weight. Um, and that's significant in the in the poultry industry because it's a very, uh, very, very tight uh, regime as far as rations go. So we'll go to the next one. Are you still keeping up there? Bird, good, sure. bird, good. That's the bird meat weight. Um, same thing, showing about a 5.3 decrease in, in in meat yield. But I say to anyone that wants to get data later on this, uh, we're happy to share it with them. So uh, it's very quick, I know, but it's giving you a cross section of what we're about. Um, that's bird weights again, that's 4.9% increase um, in, um, yep, so self-explanatory. That's laying percentage here um, on there was that showed an 8.5% increase in our laying rate, which is huge in, um, in dollar terms. Um, we we're up to cha cha cha. Are you there with that, Sam? Yes. Right. That's just a people were asking, what do we do with how do we get by char? Well, the easiest thing was to try and uh, do something gimmicky, you might say, so that's sold in the box and people have access to it and then they get a feel for it and go on and commercially buy it from there and or make it or do whatever. But it it's sort of it's been around for a long time. Um, next one. We did, we we had we did trials adding 10% biochar back into compost, and the savings in that um, are huge, particularly here in in the odor side uh, where you're using chicken manures, but also in water usage, and that's a big that's a big cost in making biochar properly in windrows, and we save you know a huge amount of water in that thing. So we'll show you here doing the the trials on that, they were done uh, a couple of years ago now, and we can save in the making of that compost probably around about two weeks in making time. Uh, and we can make compost in six weeks, but you know, 14 weeks to get it mature. So uh, next slide, which is, this is, we were burying biochar in the stockings uh, to get, and then measuring that and, and testing it at different rates and um, uh, the results were, were fantastic, yeah. 
Um, we need you you're still with me on my slides. We're right, are doing we on one. The recent bearing biochar. Bio is that where you're up to, Stuart? No. Next one. Uh, this is this is um, in capsicums and soy. Okay. Right. Um, that's that was a trial done. Um, well, it's done in a number of places, but the soy is in our own. Uh, don't take notice of the crooked rows. It's just getting more soybean in, and that's all. Um, it. Nothing, like I said, nothing we do is 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 done without. We've gone a little bit further with our granulation side these days, and we'll go to the next one. Um, sure. and things. Capsicum. The capsicum trial at the edge up in Rockhampton, and they were. You can see the the um, uh, yellowing plants were treat, not treated, and the um, all the ballots were treated with uh, different rates of biochar, and it was a, a huge success. We these days use bio, I'll go to the next one, it's called biochar coat. Um, we use, we don't supply any seed or use any seed unless we coat it with, with uh, biochar. And we add to that in the same case where we're using the biochar, we add things like diatomaceous earth in, as a, or permagard, which is a natural insecticide. So instead of coating seed with um, um, chemical based, you know, additives, we're just using biochar and some some lime. So it's working very well. Um, and I did miss some slides there, which came in and they were, uh, we've, we've been doing a lot of work with hemp biomass and uh, we're making a, uh, a basically a-, a Next, a next slide, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, I think, I haven't, yeah, I haven't got the mine, but I've got a new one. So you can you see the hemp biomass? Yes, we can. Right, yep. Yeah. So that's biomass. What we're doing these days, it's a little bit, I'll go a bit side. How much time have I got there? No, Three minutes. Got five right minutes left. Yeah. Right, what I'd like to mention here is probably one of the, uh, one of the great wins, I think, in agriculture and where it's coming. And that's, we're, we're doing some very, a lot of work in it but certainly on the use of hemp. Uh, hemp's a, a great plant, both for these, we're doing a lot of breeding or selection work. And we've got cultivars now that uh, we can actually plant and make money out of uh, with two tonne to the hectare type yield. Um, but the biomass itself is very much in demand. So there's nothing wasted, but if you look at, look at uh, the hemp side of that, we're using uh, biochar mixed with hemp and that's going back in trial work now with uh, mainly the um, mainly the pet industry, and uh, particularly the horse industry or the equine industry, and it's got huge results. So the biochar is there for a, it's part of the story, but the hemp is certainly really there, and there's nothing that you can't. It's just a, a great product to use in um, in making biochar. But I'd say that the um, the future with hemp around, uh, I mean biochar around hemp or any any industry is is huge as we go forward. Um, I think the I always say, but most of this work you have to have numbers. Uh, we spend a lot of time. We've spent a lot of time, a lot of money on research, and lucky to have people like Melissa there doing the work. And um, my thanks go to the universities. We're doing a trial now. A new one starting on uh, dung beetles and two groups of uh, breeders. There's 140 in each group. One's, one's a, a uh, control group. One's basically um, on, on biochar um, uh, consumption or is a, like a dry lick. And uh, we're hoping we get some really fantastic results out of that to enhance where we are. Uh, but I always say biochar is not all the answer, but it's part of the answer. And yeah, that pretty much warms me up on uh, what I've got to say. Yeah. So. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much, yeah. Stuart. Um, fantastic. And um, yeah, we'll come come to you if there's any questions for Stuart. Um, we'll come back to you at the end, Stuart. If you if you've got time to hang around, and um, yeah, and. Uh,
We'll, we'll go um, straight on to, um, we're just going to have five minutes um, from Stephen Joseph, Professor Stephen Joseph, who's a visiting professor um, for five universities. So Stephen, if you want to turn on your uh, your camera and uh, and uh, just give us uh, five minutes of uh, your, your uh, take on this, um, biochar and broad, broad acre agriculture. Okay, uh, I'll share the screen though. Yep. Okay. Uh, just gonna get rid of that. Okay. Um, this was a presentation I gave at an international conference, uh, and I'm just going to show a few of the slides. Um, and it's really to do with um, nitrogen use efficiency in agriculture. Um, some of the work I've been with you is related to this, uh, but this some of the more fundamental work where we to understand how we can um, basically reduce um, volatilization and leaching of nitrogen by combining it with biochar when you use a chemical fertilizer. Uh, so on the whole, um, biochars have not been to significantly improve nitrogen use efficiency. Um, this is a summary of some data from a recent paper. Um, just going down. Uh, hmm, hold on, Dom. For some reason, my computer's hung up. Uh, what is it doing? Uh, I'll have to stop sharing. Um, Okay, uh, okay. Uh, can everybody uh, use that Dom now, my screen? Yep. Is, is that okay, Sam? Yeah, that's, um, that's fine. Stephen, if you could just maybe put it in presenter mode, that would be great. Yeah, for some reason it won't scroll down in that Yeah, that's mode. it, that's perfect. Okay. Um, so what, what we've been looking at is, is making uh, composite materials. Um, I've, uh, like Stuart, I'm a great fan of diatomite. We use zeolites, we use um, basalt dust, um, we've used a peelite and, and really to um, improve the, both the cation and anion exchange of, uh, of the biochar um, to increase nutrient uptake efficiency. Um, I'm, I don't have time to go into this. Uh, we started all of this work back in China around 2010. Um, uh, hundreds of field trials, a lot more than what's been done in Australia. And basically what we found by uh, mixing uh, these different chemicals with biochar and minerals, um, that we increase the yields, we increase the crops resistance to disease, we, we cut down um, pesticides, uh, all of the sort of things that, that uh, Stuart was talking about. We've published a lot of this data, which basically showed that you can have a 30% increase in yield uh, the equivalent chemical fertilizer by replacing about 20 to 25% of the chemical fertilizer with biochar, um, big increase in uh, nitrogen uptake. And the big thing is a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So we did a lot of work looking at why biochar makes a difference. Uh, what we found is that the, the straw biochars work a lot better than wood biochars. I keep on telling people, if you want to use wood, add some sort of grass or straw. Uh, the straw biochars tend to re, uh, have surfaces that hold on to uh, nitrogen, especially a lot uh, more strongly than the wood biochars. I haven't got time to go into the chemistry. Um, the, other, the other thing we found is that uh, by um, altering the, the composition of these chemical fertilizers with minerals and with biochar, we can basically uh, reduce the cost of growing your crops. You actually in, increase the carbon efficiency. In other words, you produce a lot less CO2 per um, 
a ton of grain produced uh, and definitely increase the nitrogen use efficiency. Um, briefly, I just wanted to show you um, some of the other interesting work we've done. And um, what we found is that these uh, specially designed biochar um, uh, chemical fertilizers actually stimulate the plant roots to uptake uh, nutrients. And the reason they do that is that they actually change the potential difference between the inside of the root and the, and the soil. And the amount of energy that is required for a plant to take up nutrients is actually just a function of that potential difference um, and a couple of other things. Um, so we, we now have a, a theoretical basis for developing all of these new biochar based chemical fertilizers. Uh, we did some interesting work looking at nitrogen uptake efficiency um, and we looked at the fact that these biochar fertilizers actually increase the expression of genes for not only taking up um, nitrogen, but also for iron and silica. And iron and silica actually are really important for taking up nitrogen. It's a, quite a complex situation. Um, uh, I'm going to stop there. There's a lot more I could talk about, but uh, I don't want to um, take Craig's time. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, don't worry. We're going to be uh, running a weekly broadcast um, uh, uh, podcast as of uh, August. So I'm sure we'll get you back to talk, uh, explore this topic a bit further. Um, but this leads in now to uh, Craig Bagnall, um, who's from the CETA group. So Craig, you can turn your video on and share your screen. Um, Craig's going to, um, we're just uh, exploring a, a matrix that he's put together. Um, Craig's very good at this, um, a, a way of explaining complex uh, things um, simply. And uh, also, um, you might have noticed that uh, Stuart um, is utilising all of the uh, gas, uh, liquids and solids um, in, the, in his uh, pyrolysis plant um, at Melangany. And so uh, Craig um, will explain why that makes the biochar cheaper, um, more cost effective. So I'll hand over to you, Craig. If Thanks, Don. Um, yeah, I mean, firstly, a, a massive congratulations to all the presenters. They were outstanding. And um, I think all of us are pretty keen to try and um, get past the stigma from maybe over a decade ago where um, some of that early research was pointing towards really high application rates and costs. And as, as Stuart mentioned, people thinking that biochar would be too dusty, difficult to use or costly and expensive. And I guess one of the key challenges we want to do is try and break down um, the, those stigmas that, that, that cost was becoming a problem. So this is just a little bit of an indication of something we're going to try and build, which is just looking here in a simple application rate basis. So none of those extra benefits of um, the yield up, uh, uptakes on the other side of the balance sheet or um, even additional uh, carbon credits for the uh, improvement in soil carbon, which is very, very significant. Biochar turbocharges soil carbon potentially up to 50 fold. Like it can be very, very significant, um, mainly because those um, fungi in the soil that we can give a home to to, uh, to help improve degraded soils um, do about 75% of that carbon sequestration. Um, in, the, in the soil growth. So you can see very, very big differences in soil carbon growth um, downstream of uh, small applications of biochar. So that's not in this matrix. What we want to do here is just show a little bit of thing from the past. So I'll, I'll just quickly scroll down here. Um, it's not maybe not as simple as uh, Don made that out to be, but here in yellow at the top, we're just looking at a typical modern organic compost. Um, now I'm coming probably from a mine site rehabilitation background more so than broadacre agriculture, but broadacre applications, you're all looking at large, you know, sort of, um, you know, we're talking here, this, this is looking at 100 hectares. Um, to get it on site, delivered uh, here, I'm based in, New, in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, you're looking at 25 to $50 per tonne to get an organic compost on site. Um, it doesn't have a carbon drawdown credit, um, can be other credits applied to it, but um, 
But then if you're looking at, um, you know, uniform spread costs uh, for, for any kind of material and application rates, the typical of five to 10 tonnes a hectare, um, they need to put those down often a couple of times a year. And, you know, you're looking at, say, 50 to $200,000 type of range to be putting that kind of cost down. Um, in the past, if you had a $1,000 a tonne biochar, very, very different to a $50 a tonne compost, um, and you were putting it down at even, say, at, at high rates, and, and, and the initial trials in the past were looking in those tens of tonnes per hectare, um, basically, you could be looking at a $2 million trial to try, or not trial, but $2 million thing. It was just not economically viable. And what you see, though, is as those the cost of biochar has been dropping through the the um, not just by producing biochar, but by using the syngas. Um, so the syngas represents you know up to two thirds of the, the feedstock input um, and by mass. And, and so we're looking at uh, recovering that value. And when you use that and harness it, you've then got ability to drop the um, price of biochar. And if you increase production scale, as Stuart was saying, you can further further drop that. So as biochar production costs are dropping and application rates are dropping. Um, and then carbon credits are starting to come into play. We're starting to see these things really, really drop way, way, way down. So um, if we can see here the effect of biochar dropping, say, to about $350 a tonne down um, by having syngas and liquids uh, products uh, coming out of them as well. And maybe the introduction of a carbon credit here at around um, $40 US a tonne, um, which is currently where the kind of range that Puro's uh, trading at. Um, we're starting to see the price of 100 hectares start to come right down here towards um, you know, uh, very, very, very much more amenable prices. And in the future, as these carbon credits, which are forecast to go to one to two hundred dollars a ton US um, by 2030 um, for carbon um, dioxide removal credits in particular, drawdown credits are the premium credits um, for net zero. Um, you're going to start to see um, that's very, very uh, significant um, amounts of, of that compared to the cost, cost of biochar to the point where we slide down to the bottom here, start to see an effect of where could we see profitable regeneration happening where we might actually see a biochar price in that sort of a few hundred dollars a tonne and a carbon credit that might be worth even up to double that. Now that's, you know, being, um, uh, these are all forecasting. So, but the, uh, with, with rates dropping down now into the, kilos per hectare, as we saw, you know, 50 kilos a hectare, um, and maybe starting to drop out synthetic fertilizers away from say uh, DAP towards maybe using a biosolid. Um, we can, and recovering that with uh, minerals like zeolites, as Stephen said, to try and harness and recover the nitrogen and the phosphorus in these. We might be able to see bi a, a, a tailored customized biochar to soil constraints that is cost effective where farmers may even get potentially in the future, some kind of payment for it. And this is without looking at all those other uplifts on the back and without looking at the, um, um, the carbon credits for um, agricultural, uh, for soil carbon uplift, and without look, which is massively higher than what the biochar credit is. And also without the uh, things like compost uh, with emissions reduction like nitrous oxides and carbon, dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide reduction. So, you know, there's a number of assumptions that go under this. We've tried to do some conservative, but we're building this. We want to sort of try and sort of get this out there with industry to, to have a bit of a discussion on it. So happy to um, hear from anybody. Please contact Ansbig if you're interested in having a look at this um, and trying to help build it with us. Um, what we want to do is crush that stigma from the past and show that biochar really is arriving at scale. Thanks, Don. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Craig. Um, so, look, we'll go straight. If you can uh, unshare that screen, uh, Craig, uh, stop share. And um, if all the panellists can now turn on their videos and and audio, please. Um, Craig, if we can. Yep. And uh, um, I'll just also introduce um, uh, Annette Cowie uh, as well. So, Annette. Um, <laughs> If you could turn on your uh, screen, that'd be great. And um, Annette's from New South Wales DPI and UNE and has done a lot of work in the carbon market space. So um, uh, Annette, uh, you've got, if you just unmute yourself there. Um, yeah, did you have any questions first or would you like to come, uh, us to come back to you? Hi, 
think we're running pretty short on time, Don, and we there's are. a lot of questions that come up <laughs> well, in the Q&A, so I think uh, maybe... Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go to that. So we have hit the one and a half hour mark, so if people do have to go, um, we there is a recording. Um, so if you have to go, yeah, you, we'll send that recording to all participants. And uh, also, as you leave, there is a survey. We just ask if you could fill out the quick survey so that we can improve our, our processes. So I'll hand it over to Sam, um, Sam, uh, to uh, ask the first uh, lot of question. Uh, you're on mute, Sam. Thanks, Don. Um, so the first question open up to any of the presenters from Peter is, what is the best biochar and what are the test results? Some of the tests don't show C ES, CEC, sorry, should we come up with a standard test result? Um, I think that maybe, I mean, Stephen's done a lot of different analysis. Stephen Joseph has of all the different types of biochar, so perhaps hand that over to him. Um, I think that, um, like, just as a comment, there's one about cation exchange capacity in the soil, and everywhere that I've applied biochar in different trials we've always found a higher cation exchange capacity compared to where the biochar isn't um, but um, you know I've primarily been using Mara seeds biochar so Stephen might want to comment on the other biochars. So it's a it's a, a an interesting question and a, there's the long answer and the short answer. The short answer is the more minerals you have in the biochar on the whole the the better they work, and that uh, a straw and a grass biochar will always work better than a wood biochar in, uh, in situations where you're trying to get a plant um, response. Yeah, some, some other applications, you wood biochars are better. Um, we, we have written uh, a paper which is just about to be uh, published where we explore all of these things. Um, Annette and I and Lucas and a, and a bunch of other very um, erudite scientists have summarized uh, all of the data that we know. Um, there, there's two, the other thing that people need to understand is that the properties of biochar change um, when they go into soil and how quickly they change depends on the type of soil. So it's not a matter of just measuring the properties of a fresh biochar. You have to actually understand how those properties change as they go in, into soil. Um, so so there's, there's both the science and the art of biochar. Um, just to follow on from what Melissa said with Mara Seeds biochar, what you find is that the mixed feedstock uh, with minerals uh, works better than a single feedstock without minerals biochar. And that's, uh, that's after, you know, probably thousands of trials. Um, so there's, there's some reasons why you might just put wood biochar. So for instance, um, uh, Doug Powell in Western Australia, when he put his avocados in, he needed to change the soil properties so he put in a very large amount of wood biochar underneath his avocados. Uh, and, and that helped uh, to improve the soil properties. Um, he then did a bunch of other things uh, and that meant that uh, uh, the biochar was just part of a, an overall management project, but he was looking at changing soil properties more than, more than trying to increase uh, plant uptake through um, some other application uh, of of um, the property of biochar. Can, can I jump in there too? I think the, the short answer that Joey's just given you the long answer for is the, um, the best biochar depends on what you want to do with it. So you need to know its properties. And so to the last part of your question about the standard tests, there has been a lot of work in um, taking this, this type of uh, soil tests that we use and then adapting them for biochar. So the International Biochar Initiative has published a document with uh, standard test methods for biochar 
And Anne's big has also worked on um, the same concept for the code of practice and uh, working towards a standard uh, for testing biochar. So we have that in hand and those documents are available on the, on the web. Thanks. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Melissa. Melissa, while we're with you, we'll go to a question that was here from you from Mark. And he said, what changes occurred, assuming external, question mark, for the second measurement in the DUNG trial to be lower for every treatment? Oh, I have to pull that back up, my, share my screen to have a look at what he meant. Is that, can we do that quickly? Uh, I'll have to go back to... Yeah, I can move on to, yeah, if you can, uh, sure. Oops, screen sharing stopped, sorry. Um, so second measurement. Um, whoops. So if we look at the marker Rasi fungi one here, so what was the question? What changes occurred to the second measurement? In the dumb trial to be lower for every treatment. Uh, it's not lower. It's primarily higher. Like, Depends on what, all. so this is it. So we had 200 kilograms um, of biochar in the dung here, and then we had 100 kilograms under the dung and 200 kilos under the dung. Um, so um, the nothing trial had no dung at all. And the, um, this one had dung only. So depending on what, uh, you know, more often than not, we had the two kilograms of biochar in the dung having better results, but often the 200 kilos under the dung had had good results as well. So if we look at the organic carbon, we had uh, more organic carbon, we put 200 kilos under the dung. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess I described those those changes that I, I believe are happening within the soil. I mean, we found increased mycorrhizae fungi, but we also found increased um, nutrients all round and better nutrients in the pasture tissue as well. Didn't have time to show all of that. Um, so I think that the, the biochar is holding moisture in the soil, providing that microbial bridge and opportunity for microbes to, to grow in the soil. We found a difference in pH in the soil where there was biochar. Um, and so there's a whole lot of chemical um, processes going on, but um, in general, also we're building the, the microbes and, and fungi. Melissa, um, Mark's pointed out that it's slide 17 he's talking about. 17, okay, this one. Thanks. So where there was more biomass, um, so what changes occurred to increase the biomass? Is that a To question? decrease it in the second column in each of the groups, the second column oh, is lower than the third. Oh, it's only because of when we, um, so we've got different times that we, we, we took the pasture cuts. So uh, we've got one in autumn, one in winter, one in spring. So in winter, the pasture growth is a lot slower because it's colder and um, there wasn't as much biomass. So we had, I guess, differences in, in that time because, because it was sort of colder and, and, and lower biomass. And um, yeah, I guess um, the, the dung was still being, so that was only a short time period into the trial where the, the dung was still being buried by dung beetles as well. So I think the better results to look at would be the spring biomass. Great, thank you, Melissa. Hopefully that answers your question, Mark. We got there in the end. Um, yeah. So uh, Melissa, I'll go to your question that you had for Stuart actually. So Stuart, this one's for you. So how much biochar and diatomaceous earth do you add to seeds? Is anything else added? Uh, look, it, it varies a bit. Um, some people want uh, two to one, some people want five to one. But what I can do if you contact, oh, I can send you through the, um, uh, the detail on that. One of the things that um, you've got to bear in mind is that a lot of people want to coat more um, so they can spread it easily. But that nece doesn't necessarily help the result in that the more you, the heavier and the larger you make those granules, the, we can do a five to one to a two to one, uh, but your germination drops, so you've got to put more on anyway. So it's it's a bit of a how you want to use it, uh, but probably the best way 
is to give you the detail of what we actually do when we make those those granules. I can send it through you to you. Thanks, Stuart. That'd be great. <laughs> right. Eh? I've got That'd some of your biochar. I'm going to sew another paddock, so I'm <laughs> interested <laughs> from that perspective. And so, Stuart, we've got a few more questions for you, so you can stay on the mic if that's okay. So, um, Stuart. Does Stuart use uh, scrubbers before storing the sin gas? Uh, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's in the process of going on now, but it's certainly scrubbed, yeah. Okay, great. And um, I think, Stuart, this is, yes, it must be for you. Why is quenching biochar an issue? Is it just the wetness of the product? And that's from Peter. Go again. Yeah, so why is quenching biochar an issue? Oh, is yeah. it just the wetness of the product? Uh, quenching's, quenching's done to slow the process. So in other words, once you've had a hot process, what you're doing is that it, 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 when you, when you, it's a bit like lighting a match, you make biochar, then charcoal, then ash. So if you don't stop that, stop the heat and stop the plant, uh, stop the... Um, uh, reduce that heat, you've got to quench it, do it somehow, you've got to do it with either water or you've got to do it with, um, we're using a dry sand at the moment, um, a cool sand. So it's to, if you don't, it, it could, you know, if the heat stays in there, it can turn into ash, which is pointless when you're chasing biochar. I think the person was also interested to know why use sand rather than water. Um, in our case here, what we're looking to do is to granulate the um, uh, granulate the product. So most products you put through what we call an IRIC. Um, it's a high-speed uh, coated granulator mixer. Uh, you always dry your products down anyway, and that's a simple way of doing it. So obviously, if you use water, you've then got to dry it anyway. So you can use cool sand uh, to do the same thing. Is that right, Stu? Or Craig? <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's, uh, there's a few other things, Stuart, but that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. All right. Great. Great. Um, and then why is hemp biochar ground to 2 UM? Um, mainly because it's used in, in mixes, you know, back in, uh, we then make a pellet out of that or uh, we can make a, a granule out of it. And, you know, you've got to have particle size. The finer the particle size, the easier it is to do it. Yeah, simple as that. Great. Wonderful. Um, well, I think those are all of the questions um, answered there. If anyone's got any others for any of our three presenters, then please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Otherwise, I will hand it back to Don. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, everyone, for their questions. So um, before we uh, before we close, um, yeah, do we have any any uh, closing comments from uh, from any of our, our presenters or panel panel today? Any other closing? Uh, Melissa here. Yeah, I, I mean, I just wanted to make a comment about biochar rates. And I think, um, you know, Craig and Ewan and others have touched on that. And I think that um, there's so much more work to be done on rates. But, um, you know, in broadacre agriculture, we're certainly seeing differences at one and 200 kilos per hectare. And, um, you know, I think one of the great things that came out today is um, each of us have done research on, on, um, biochar and, uh, and nitrogen fertilizers and it's certainly showing that it has some great potential to um, stop leaching and, and encourage um, nitrates to stay uh, become more available and mineralized for longer um, so I, I just think there's a lot of work to be done we, we just don't know but n more biochar is not necessarily better just a closing comment from me yep Craig um well, on that note, I guess was um, certainly something that Lucas Van Sweeten's always said is that, uh, and Stephen as well, from all their trial work over all the years, is that if you put a, a biochar that's 
a straight biochar in a soil and, and you're not looking at the soil constraints and you're not matching it, um, it may act as an activated carbon and, and actually soak things in and actually um, have a detrimental effect initially rather than actually giving and, and acting as that exchange mechanism that it can do. So the idea of pre-treating pre, uh, and inoculating and um, blending um, things into your biochar to characterise it specifically for an application is critical. Um, I just wanted to encourage Sue, anyone out there um, to have a look at the ANS Big Code of Practice if they haven't, which is about testing biochars. Uh, with the, uh, with, we're basically gearing up within ANS Big to try and take, um, to launch commercially biochar. It's been seen for a very long time as a cottage industry. So um, have a look at that and see in terms of um, the characterization of biochar production to see about how that might apply in your field if you've got an interest in it, and please provide feedback. Um, and also support ends big. If you're not a member, have a think about it because um, we're trying to lobby the Australian government with methods under the Emissions Reduction Fund for many uh, opportunities to have um, greenhouse gas benefits from the production, but also the application of biochar. At the moment, there's only a method for uh, use in soil where it's not actually um, at its max, not maximised, and, and there's a lot more opportunity we can do with it. It's currently under review. Um, but we're, we're working on that. So, and I had one quick question for Stuart to answer, which was if he could, um, one of the feedbacks I always got from the mine rehab sector was biochar 10 years ago, too expensive and too difficult to work with in terms of dusty, as you said, in terms of granulation and pelletization. Do you feel now that broad acre application uh, mechanisms with that is well and truly arrived and, and, and we can sort of put that one to bed? Oh, I think it's still in the process, but, you know, in granulating, um, like I said in my talk there, that biochar is only part of the story. So if you can granulate biochar and you can add, say, biology back in to that, like it does happen with peat and things like that these days, but if you can, you can do that, you certainly create another, like adding nutrients, nutrient value or, or biology back in there. It's a, it's a vehicle for it to travel. That's the best way of putting it, you know, and I think it's, we haven't even started in that, but it's something that we are doing some work on it at the moment, uh, on trial work, and uh, it's, it's coming up pretty well. Mm. I've seen in the US, there's a lot of uh, work being done on spreaders and methods for, I guess, you know, applying it in different ways mm. in, in larger applications, but probably a chance for us to try and, I know Anne's big and Stuart's uh, part of that is doing, trying to get our trials going into Broadacre. So that's the other thing too, if anyone's out there in industry, we're, we're, we're looking to try and um, secure um, Broadacre trials across the, uh, across the industry to, to go to big scale to do these, including some of these things have been done overseas and, and, and um, you know, leveraging on all the work, great work that's been done here by people like Stuart. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other closing comments? Uh from any, any of our panel? Just a quick one, Don. Uh, just on research, I, I think it's really important that we're careful going forward about who we engage to do our research because some of the bigger organisations, and won't mention names, but I've already mentioned them, uh, they, they will own... Well, you don't get a choice of who does the trials and I'm not sure how much IP is um, actually yours when you engage with those sort of organisations. So I think it's really important that we just take a... A careful approach to that. But great presentations all around, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Anyone else? Stephen or Annette? Any, Stuart? Got any closing? No, You're right. Lots of great information there today, Don. Uh, lots of people interested in more of the details of um, the results presented. Um, most of the trials I think presented today are are not actually in published literature um, that people can readily access. So is there a way that people can access the data? I know a few people have suggested contacting individuals directly for that. Um, is that basically it? Um, uh, mine, um, the, the, the dairy trial we just um, is in press that's being published as we speak. And the soil trial results um, will be published as well. But um, most of that, apart from the soil trial results I showed up, there's a whole lot of data on my website you're welcome to have a look at and, and um, technical reports as well. Yeah, and we've, we've uploaded all the presentations into a shared folder. 
uh, as well. So all participants can access the, the slides afterwards. Great, thank you. And Craig's matrix. And um, Stephen, closing comments? Um, just one of the things that's come out of all of this work, it, it's really important how and where you put the biochar. Uh, as well as its um, biochar is, is dose dependent. In other words, different biochars and different soils with different plants will have an optimum application rate and an optimum way of applying it. Um, <clears throat> and researchers can't do all of this. I mean, this is where the farmer comes in. It's like, uh, you know, if, if you go around to people who've been using biochar for a while, they've worked out the best way of applying a specific biochar for their soils and their, their crops. Um, and there's lots of interesting stories. I think uh, one of the, the early webinars was on using biochar for, for growing truffles. Um, and, and uh, you know, the way he's making it and using it is very different to uh, what somebody who's growing wheat will actually do to give them maximum results. So just be aware that researchers can't give you all the answers. You know, if you want to take on biochar, you've got to take on the fact that you'll be learning over a period of years how to best use a, a specific biochar. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And um, Stephen, we've also uploaded, uh, so I'll just make mention at this point that uh, ANSBIG uh, has received its first funding for a research project, which is going to be carried out um, at Sanderlands at Stewart's uh, uh, property, uh, 8,000 uh, hectares he's got there um, in between Casino and uh, Tenterfield. And um, we're going to uh, uh, be uh, looking at the um, benefits of, of biochar in animal health. Um, and uh, with that method of uh, using, uh, feeding our animals biochar and using dung beetles to bury it, um, we'll measure soil carbon in, um, in plot trials. And, uh, and also we, we're looking at pasture improvements. So um, Stephen has a, uh, a biochar spray uh, that he's developed. And uh, I've put that slide up on the, in the shared folder. And uh, we're going to be applying that at rates of 200 uh, kilograms per hectare and also 10 tonnes per hectare. So it'll be very interesting. So that's over the next two years. Um, and uh, thank you, um, everyone uh, today who spoke. Um, because it is the uh, end of the financial year, we're going to do a special offer. Um, if you uh, want to spend some money before... Uh, the end of the day, uh, you can join ANSBIG and uh, we will um, then uh, very cleverly give you back a refund for this webinar in the new financial year. So it's a win-win. So um, you can do that. Uh, and and um, um, it, there are many benefits anyway um, to, to joining ANSBIG. So um, we'll offer that to you. Um, we'll be uh, also sending out um, uh, all, all of the uh, recording for this and including that shared, uh, shared folder uh, with all the resources. So that's all the membership benefits uh, for joining ANSBIG. And uh, coming up <clears throat> um, this all uh, in, in our next uh, webinar, um, we've got uh, on July, Wednesday the 28th, and this has been initiated by Craig uh, Bagnall, um, biomass crops for biochar and rehabilitating degraded land toward productive land uh, for food. So this is uh, becoming a big thing and uh, <clears throat> we've already got um, uh, presenters in place um, from New South Wales DPI who will talk about, um, you know, uh, energy or biomass crops uh, that farmers can use. Um, we'll also uh, have Charles... Charles Coves, who's from the Australian Hemp Alliance. And of course, uh, hemp is a wonderful crop and Stuart knows this. Um, you, can, you can grow a, a crop of hemp and then you can pretty much grow anything after it. Um, is that correct, Stuart? Um, it's so correct. Yeah. And also, of course, think, yeah, go on. Mm -hmm. um, as we go along, we're doing some colour work in aiming that hemp to do certain things like um, 
particularly in latitude to where you grow it and how you grow it and what you're chasing. Um, but there's some of the work that, you know, has been done in China and, and Stephen will know about it, but, you know, what they claim in being able to store in carbon and in uh, per hectare is huge. And if you look yes. at where we are, in, uh, where we are today with um, meeting these targets, uh, I think it's something that, you know, the authorities need to look at it very closely. Yes. So, um, um, yeah, look, and, and of course it grows very quickly. Um, and so we can be, uh, you know, growing, growing a lot um, in a short period of time. We've also got um, uh, Peter Brown from Miss Canthus, New Zealand. Um, and that's another um, very interesting crop uh, that we're looking at. And hopefully um, if, uh, if Craig can get onto them, um, we're looking at uh, some aquatic uh, feed stocks as well um, that can be turned into biochar like like hemp, uh, sorry, like kelp. Um, so uh, that should be a really interesting webinar uh, next month. And uh, of course, um, yeah, th this all's leading towards our conference in Perth. Um, so abstracts uh, are now open um, to... Uh, uh, submit before August 5, Thursday, August 5. And uh, if any of our presenters who, who uh, would be interested in submitting an abstract, um, you just go to the conference page there. Uh, you can download the uh, templates there. So if you're submitting a research paper, you can get it there. Or if it's just a generic presentation, um, like uh, you know a PowerPoint presentation, um, that's the summary template there. If you want to uh, uh, put in an expression of interest to demonstrate, um, please email Sam. And also, if you want to run a practical uh, workshop, um, we want to make this year's conference uh, as interactive as possible. So not only will we have the sit-down presentations, but we'll also have um, interactive work workshops as well. And uh, we're also looking at... Um, a field a field trip um, uh, to a pyrolysis plant in uh, in WA, and um, a big thanks to you know our all of our um, sponsors, uh, which is Green Man Char, Conher, Rainbow Beida, and New World Pavement Solutions, and uh, Silently Silent Partner uh, Cedar Group as well, and uh, it's going to be at the South of Perth Yacht Club, and uh, if uh, COVID restrictions are in place at the time. Um, we'll have a, a, a twin venue uh, in in uh, in Sydney um, where where we can gather on the eastern states and then have have a gathering a smaller gathering on the western states and we'll be running it virtually so um, presenters can either present live um, at that location um, or come in uh, via Zoom wherever they're located. So, um, yeah, the theme, biochar in the carbon drawdown decade. So it's uh, it's all leading into that and uh, it's very exciting. So thank you very much, um, yeah, everyone, uh, for all of our panel again for excellent presentations. Um, and I'm going to, and all the participants as well, and I'm just going to leave um, leave you with a, a video um, of the uh, the world's first pellet harvester, um, which uh, which will give you an indication um, of uh, you know what the potential is of uh, of biomass uh, turning biomass. They say that um, uh, pelletizing uh, uh, hay or any sort of straw. Um, is about five times the uh, combined energy of a, a bale of hay. So, um, uh, yeah, look, I think um, given it's an early webinar, um, I'm now going to go home and have some of your uh, green eggs and ham, Stuart, for lunch. And, uh, and um, we'll, we'll catch up with you all next time. Charles. See you. Bye.